Thank you very much, Clive, and good morning, everyone. Thank you all to the uh, organizers and to the introductory speakers for setting us off on such a great journey over the next couple of days. Uh, in the traditional manner, I'm now going to find my screen to share with you. So hopefully this will go smoothly. Uh, yeah, we're all becoming very used to online conferences now, aren't we? And, and I think one of the things um, that I quite like about them is that they have a lot of the same features as, uh, as normal conferences. We're always a little bit over time because there's so many interesting things to say. And uh, also uh, the technology can sometimes let us down, but hopefully uh, this, will, this will run smoothly today. So yes, um, I was invited to speak a little bit about how we can position the growth of interest in nature-based solutions in a wider kind of uh, context of how cities are responding to sustainability challenges through this idea of sustainable transitions. And as it happens, I think my, my slides and my opening really does coincide with a lot of the issues that the uh, speakers have raised with us already this morning about how we can see cities as having been both part of the problem and part of the solution to the many uh, global sustainability challenges that we face. Now, my research has traditionally looked at how cities are responding to climate change, and I've been working in that field since the late 1990s. Uh, and over that time, a body of research has shown us that local governments and city authorities have positioned themselves as central to the international effort to address climate change through three key means. First of all, by recognizing that they have a significant contribution to the problem, so they're responsible for greenhouse gas emissions and also the levels of vulnerability of their urban populations, that they have the capacity to take action. Uh, often decisions about infrastructure, patterns of consumption are um, figured locally. And also that, of course, local government has a democratic mandate. It's elected by and for the people. And so there's a, a space for discussion, debate and, and decision making about how to address these challenges. But also, I think the third C here is really critical, um, that cities have been acting in relationship to sustainability transitions because of the co-benefits, the ways in which key challenges such as climate change can be brought down to earth to connect it to specific local concerns, whether that might be addressing energy poverty, whether it might be in terms of making uh, public transport more affordable, city centres more livable. These issues have been what's also animated the urban response. And just one, uh, one particular sort of image and also uh, issue to illustrate this with is the growing energy demand that we expect to see from cooling our cities in the future as we start to inhabit an ever warming planet. Uh, the International Energy Agency predicts that uh, the figure for air conditioning will triple over the next uh, 20 to 30 years. So that while air conditioners and electric fans currently account for about 10% of all global electricity, we can expect the figure of the total amount of electricity consumed by cooling to triple. And the number of air conditioners in buildings is projected to grow from 1.6 billion today to something like 5.6 billion by 2050. So we're literally going to be kind of baking in increasing electricity demand into our cities unless we do something about this and i of course pick this example because we know and we understand how important urban forests can be for providing cooling services in the city so we really have a choice here about what we want to do for cooling cities in the future and we can see that this choice matters when we look at how cities are being part of the problem around climate change we can see that, for example, the highest emitting 100 urban areas account for 18% of the global carbon footprint. Cities account for up to 70% of energy related greenhouse gas emissions and particularly important increasing attention to the material consumption of the world's cities. And I think this was also referred to by the opening speakers about just where all the resources are going to come from to develop our urban centers in the future. But at the same time, on the other half of the slide, we can see the positive points that cities do have the direct powers, uh, the concentration of people, the interconnected, uh, interconnected nature of these systems, meaning you can address more than one problem at once, and that they are identified as a key arena for change going forwards. And over the last three or four years, I think what we've witnessed in the wider debate about sustainability transitions is a realization that it, climate change, while still central to the urban agenda, is not the only big sustainability challenge that cities can address. And in fact, we're seeing a, a greater interest in how cities can 
directly respond to the biodiversity crisis, to the crisis in nature. Um, and recent work that we've been doing within the Naturevation Project has shown through an examination of all the initiatives that are happening across Europe that we've collected in our Urban Nature Atlas, which I'll tell you a little bit more about in a minute, that cities are already taking active measures to protect nature, to restore nature, and also to enable their populations to thrive with nature. And in all of the ways that colleagues have already mentioned, it's been so important during the last year. So alongside the climate agenda as a key sustainability transition, we're now seeing nature and biodiversity emerging on this uh, urban agenda as really important for cities to be working, not only locally, but with implications that stretch across the scales to being also a very important part of our global response to the biodiversity crisis. And within the Convention on Biodiversity, there's increasing uh, pressure and moves to include cities and urban responses much more directly as part of the response to the post-2020 global biodiversity framework, which is currently under negotiation. Into this fray, if you like, into this sort of set of challenges and problems and, and ways in which cities are trying to negotiate, navigate their responses, has emerged this idea of nature-based solutions. And I'm sure for many people uh, joining us today, this will be a very familiar term, possibly slightly exasperating term for many people who've been working in the field already on all the other things that nature-based solutions uh, in includes. And I do like to think of it as an umbrella term that includes uh, things which people have been working on for many years from ecosystem services, green space, green infrastructure, and so on and so forth. It's a way of gathering these things together and giving them more prominence. Um, and I think showing the connections between them. And in the Naturevation project, what we've tried to do, we're almost at the end actually, we'll finish this May, which is a bit difficult to consider can, that we've been working on it now for four or five years and we've produced a lot, but of course we also think that we're just getting started. But in the Naturevation project, what we've been thinking about is framing the growth and development of nature-based solutions and their possibilities within this wider kind of approach to sustainability transitions. And what that literature on sustainability transitions tells us is that for successful transition pathways, we need to look both at the urban dynamics of nature-based solutions, which are those things which are the innovations which are coming up from the grassroots, from city organizations, from civil society, businesses working on the ground. But we also need to understand the structural conditions that shape which of those innovations will be successful. And that in our project has been what we've been focusing on. I mentioned uh, in passing earlier the Urban Nature Atlas that we've produced in the project. This is a survey of a, of a hundred cities in Europe, uh, which has collected a thousand examples of nature-based solutions uh, across those cities. It's fully searchable online and there is also a more detailed research version of the database, which is available if you want to get in touch with us. We're just updating the database now and the final version will be available before the project ends. Um, looking across this database, what we find is that while nature-based solutions are uh, addressing multiple different sustainability development goals, we still see that there is a clear opportunity gap to work with cities. Cities are focusing primarily on green space, habitats and biodiversity, as we might expect. And then what's really interesting is that issues of regeneration and health and well-being are also high on the agenda. But some of the more traditional environmental concerns, such as water management, climate change, are down the agenda, environmental quality such as air pollution. And so we see here that there's plenty of nature-based solutions taking place in Europe where their potential to address climate, water and environmental quality concerns may not have been fully realized. And at the same time, in those projects, the climate, uh, water and environmental quality projects, other issues such as cultural heritage, social justice, sustainable consumption, as well as regeneration and health are also missing. So we have a bit of a mismatch between the different kinds of projects which are happening. And we think that looking at these uh, dynamics of innovation and the regimes within which innovations are taking place can help us address this opportunity gap. And what we've done in the project is to look at how diverse modes of governance, novel business models, different kinds of finance arrangements and active forms of citizen engagement can help. Uh, we've, looked, we've conducted 54 detailed case studies, so there's lots of rich material, it's been a huge uh, team effort, about 80 people working on the project over four years. Um, so I'm just going to show you a, a snapshot now, uh, given time, of what, what the kinds of things are that we've been looking at. 
And this is some work led by colleagues at Utrecht on the business models that can support urban nature-based solutions. And what we did is we looked across all of these different case studies of what was working on the ground to identify prototypes, uh, types of models uh, that could be supportive of capturing the value of nature-based solutions and translated into other situations. And we see that risk reduction, which is very much co connected to climate change, stewardship, densification and green health are just four of the eight uh, kinds of business models that we saw were being used by different organizations uh, across Europe and indeed beyond because our case studies stretch internationally. And when we say business models here, we're being, I suppose, a little bit loose, fast and loose with that term because we don't necessarily mean that these will be models uptaken by business. These are models through which the value of nature, the value of something like an urban forest can be seen and whether that value is something that can be quantified and monetized or whether that value is simply a kind of value that's recognized and celebrated and curated. Um, these are value capture models in a way. And our analysis suggests that none of these models on their own will be sufficient to promote nature-based solutions as a form of urban innovation for sustainability transitions, but rather we're likely to have to bring these different models together in co-financing uh, arrangements. And that is quite complicated in terms of governance because it means a whole set of actors, say from the health sector and the building sector, who may not previously have worked together, are going to need to collaborate if we're going to really make the difference with nature-based solutions on the ground. This looks like a bit of a, a challenging diagram for uh, this early on a Tuesday morning, but I promise you that it is actually quite straightforward underneath. The other thing that we've been doing in the project uh, through case study countries. Uh, we've looked at six different countries across the European Union. Think about what is enabling nature-based solutions to be taking off now? What are the factors in the regulatory uh, policy landscape that are allowing for this to happen? What kinds of forms of finance are important? And how is the urban development industry in the broadest sense of that term, including local community groups, uh, different sorts of uh, housing providers, whether they're providing housing for profit or not, how are they getting engaged as well? And what we found is that there are 20 key stepping stones or kind of leverage points, if you like, across this landscape that work across all of these different countries. And some of them are, are, are listed here. So providing a public mandate. So with governments at all levels, getting behind nature-based solutions is really important. Establishing demonstration projects, improving data and monitoring. Colleagues were talking about that earlier on already. Different kinds of valuation models. So these are the stepping stones that work. And what we're finding is that these stepping stones are being aligned in different ways. Different groups of these stepping stones matter if you want to push forward on climate change or on biodiversity. Not all of these leverage points will get you to the destination of all of the sustainable development goals. I hope that makes a bit of sense. So the key thing is that if we want to mainstream nature-based solutions for biodiversity and climate change, we have to find the selection, the group of leverage points that will do both of those agendas together. If we forget about one agenda, so if we forget about biodiversity and just look at the leverage points for climate change, we may not get to a biodiversity destination. And that's maybe not that surprising. If you take the route towards climate change, that's where you're going to get. If you want to also get to a destination on biodiversity, you have to take the stepping stones that get you there as well. Another key part of our project, and I've just got about another minute to go here, I think, is to show that what will be critical to making this work in the long term. And I really like the idea that a colleague in the opening remarks suggested that we don't even we don't just need to plant forests, but we need to grow them. And growing these forests and growing nature based solutions in cities means that we must take society with us. And this must be a transition that matters for all different parts of society. And so while we've shown that they can generate multiple sustainability benefits, it does not always mean that they will. And if we want nature-based solutions to address questions of social justice, that also has to be key to the leverage points that we press. So they can be designed and implemented in a way that exacerbate inequalities, but they can also be done in a way that is much more inclusive and brings those who need to benefit from nature the most with them. And I'll suggestion is for the adoption of a set of principles that allow us to realize this over the long term. We've seen actually that the most successful nature-based solutions don't put these principles to the side. 
most successful projects that have been growing strongly over a period of time have several of these principles embedded. So they are a strong root system for a nature-based solution. They anchor them in our urban fabric, in our urban communities. If you only have one or two of these, so you can be ambitious and practical, but if all the other roots are dead, then this nature-based solution is not going to thrive. So I like to use a little root uh, system metaphor here to, to, to show what we mean. Um, so in a sense, it's not a choice that is only about uh, being principled, but it also means that all the other aspects of the nature-based solution will thrive if these principles are deeply embedded. And I just want to end with something that I, you know, I, I, my family are Australian. I have a lot of my, my family over there. And of course, it's a very far away place at the moment. And um, one of the things that I've loved the most, a project that we've also looked at in the, in the study of nature is the Melbourne's approach to the forest strategy. I'm sure many of you will be familiar with it as well. But uh, when Melbourne started to try to monitor the tree health of their urban forests, what they found was that people started to write them not just about whether the tree was dying or not or whether they thought it needed more water but their admiration and love for nature and i think we can't forget just how important urban nature is in creating those connections not only with the natural world but with one another um, and so i think we should all probably be writing love letters to the trees that we miss in faraway places right now uh, but remembering that when we're doing nature-based solutions we're not just doing it for the instrumental reasons, all of the very good reasons that nature matters in cities, but we're doing it because we love it. Um, and that has to be heart of what we're doing. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Harriet. And uh, if you could um, please stop sharing your screen. And um, very uh, comprehensive um, presentation and interesting to hear certainly about the uh, work of the Nature Nation Project. Um, it does seem a shame when these projects come to an end. I, I fully understand that. Um, I've been asked to remind people that they can uh, pose uh, questions uh, in uh, the Q&A chat box. And uh, if you would like to do so, we have a team of people at EFI who will help to uh, direct those questions. And uh, I would uh, invite you to use that. Um, we'll move straight on. Um, I would like to uh, introduce two speakers now, uh, Jerry Lee Wilkes uh, Allen and uh, Giuseppe Escaracia Mugnosa. I hope I've done a reasonable job at pronouncing your, um, <laughs> your names. Uh, Jerry Lee uh, teaches forest policy, uh, forest governance and urban forestry at the Bern University of Applied Sciences in Switzerland. And uh, I would also uh, say that she's also co-founder. I noticed in uh, her CV, she said co-funder. So maybe she's a generous person as well. Uh, of the board member of Arbor CityNet, a Swiss association working in the uh, field of earth and forestry. And very grateful for their support in EFUF this year as well. Uh, Giuseppe teaches forest ecosystems and urban forestry. Uh, at the University of Tusha in Viterbo and also at the first University of Rome. And I note that he's also past chair of the board of the European Forest Institute, so I'll have to be polite what I say. Anyway, a big thank you to Jerry Lee and uh, Giuseppe. Thank you very much. Um, you're going to be talking about Biocities for a Resilient Future, Narratives, Actions and Research Gaps. So over to you. Thank you very much for this nice introduction, Clive. We are very happy to be here together to, uh, with Giuseppe Scaraccia to present or to talk about Biocities for a Resilient Future, Narratives, Actions and Research Gaps. Um, you have heard a lot what I, uh, at the beginning, what I will say, you have heard already a lot in the morning, but I think it's a good introduction to, to our presentation. So as you all know, and as you can see from this graph, cities are growing rapidly. Between 1950 and 2020, the urban population in Europe increased from 51 to 75 percent, and this trend is expected to, to continue. Additionally, cities consume close to two thirds of the world's energy and account for more than 70 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions. The world is facing changing climatic conditions, overexploitation of natural resources, and biodiversity loss. This development challenged cities through unexpected events and crises, such as COVID-19. All of this uh, leads us to rethink the way we are living, 
now. And we all probably agree that we need a paradigm change of our current way of how we live. This paradigm change is needed for cities to become more sustainable, more resilient and more livable. We need to rethink existing structures and paradigms of urban development to develop sustainable and resilient concepts. Currently, there are some emerging concepts such as uh, civil, civic uh, ecological modernization, which is a concept that offers a model in which economic growth, environmental protection, and energy security are mutually reinforced. Or the concept of green, uh, green governance, which, is, uh, which uh, advocates the necessity of global climate stewardship and planetary carbon control. Or the concept of circular bioeconomy, which, uh, which um, proposes an urban future that is circular, regenerative, resilient, and bio. There are also uh, a lot of uh, national and international initiatives, such as biophilic uh, cities, which facilitates a global network of partner cities working collectively to pursue the vision of nature, natureful city within their unique and diverse environments and cultures or Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance, which is a collaboration of living global cities working to achieve carbon neutrality in the next 10 to 20 years, or the Smart Cities uh, concept, which is, which, is a, um, which is a framework to collect data from cities in order to promote sustainable development practices to, in order to address grow, uh, growing urbanization challenges. However, despite the fact that there are several initiatives and narratives they didn't trigger so far um, the, 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 the transformation in the cities. They didn't manage to scale up. Um, and they are just looking at some aspects of, of, of city development. So in order to make the change happen, we need to rethink our cities in a holistic way. I think uh, it was already mentioned it before where all relevant aspects are integrated, such as spatial planning, city planning, urban life, et cetera, and where economy and ecology have the same value and where synergies between both are, are identified and thrift, and as well where urban forestry are the heart of this development. To be able to reach this goal, we need to know the actions that currently exist, as well as the research gaps that need to be filled to reach the goal of bio-based cities bio cities. And in this context, my colleague uh, Giuseppe Scarascia will talk to you about the actions and later I will talk to you about the research gaps. The word is yours, Giuseppe. Thank you, Jerry Lee, and thank you, Clive. Good morning to all of you in this beautiful uh, urban forestry day. Um, what I would like to uh, share with you is uh, the activity that we are uh, doing with uh, EFI. Considering the importance of nature, trees, and forests for a new approach to uh, biocities and to the cities of tomorrow, the uh, European Forest Institute just uh, uh, last summer has launched a, um, a call for uh, a green book of biocities. Now, this green book uh, includes uh, uh, writing, preparing uh, the book with a new vision about BioCity, but also to develop a research agenda for uh, gaps and uh, uh, needs uh, of new research activities to be developed, particularly by uh, the facility, by a new facility that uh, EFI is launching um, about BioCities and uh, trees and urban forests, as Mark Palai just uh, mentioned at the, uh, at the beginning. Next, Jerry Lee. So uh, the focus of uh, this action of this green book is about obviously about the transformation potential on, on of forest, uh, ranging from uh, utilizing trees and forests in the city, but also uh, a, an important precious material as, as wood. And uh, we will have a truly interdisciplinary approach in this, uh, in this action, in this uh, green book, and of course also in the uh, new facility. Next one. So um, interdisciplinarity means that uh, uh, we will deal from uh, biodiversity to um, uh, green infrastructure and urban forest, from public health 
that is so important, it was already mentioned, to urban governance and community engagement. And also from a, a new thinking about circular bioeconomy to utilizing wood as a material or also um, dealing with uh, energy uh, efficiency. Next. And the, uh, the uh, structure of, uh, our, uh, of our uh, green book and of our action will be to uh, map uh, different actions in cities. And today already we heard very interesting information from uh, various projects. Uh, we should provide uh, examples on uh, potential impact of uh, developing bio cities, but also uh, group uh, good practices from uh, many parts uh, of the world. And finally, uh, all of this information should be used to identify major knowledge and education gaps that we will feed toward uh, the project of uh, coordinated by Jerry Lee that should, de that should deal mainly with uh, uh, developing the uh, research agenda. Next. Okay, here is just uh, uh, a list of the different uh, partners that are part uh, uh, of our Green Book uh, uh, endeavor. So you can see from, they are from many parts of Europe dealing with uh, different, uh, uh, let's say, knowledge field, but also uh, we will, uh, let's say, uh, uh, be uh, enriched by the uh, collaboration from other parts of the world, Hong Kong, US, but also FAO and United Nations will be part uh, of our uh, activity, uh, mainly coordinating the uh, stakeholders um, collaboration and, uh, uh, let's say, uh, provisioning of uh, information from not only from Europe, but also from many parts of the world. Next. Okay, this is a quite complex structure and diagram of the uh, activities uh, on which the book, the green book is based, but basically uh, as you can see from the uh, left, uh, upper left part of the diagram, the green book will be mainly based on uh, uh, pillars, uh, ecosystem services and tools uh, about uh, the BioCity concept. These concepts will uh, feed into uh, focus group discussion that are already helping us in writing uh, the different uh, chapters. And finally, uh, the output will be uh, the green book, as I said, but also information for the work of Jerry Lee and this group on developing the uh, research agenda. The timeline is basically throughout this year. So we started uh, at the end of last summer and uh, the um, final uh, review and uh, edition and production of the Green Book is expected by the end uh, of this year. Next. So the structure uh, of the Green Book, uh, basically there are uh, 12 different uh, chapters uh, from uh, a vision and conceptual framework of BioCity as an introduction that will be utilized uh, by all, I mean, with information that will be utilized by all the different uh, uh, and following uh, uh, chapters. Um, nature will be a fundamental part of, uh, for instance, of chapter three, and then urban forest, uh, health, and so on, social environment, uh, down to the, uh, the way forward uh, with the last uh, chapter. Here are, next one, here are just uh, uh, some um, more uh, information about some of the important chapters, like for instance, the first one that should provide the vision for, for a new BioCity, how to rethink urban uh, development based mainly on uh, social, on an, a new approach of social uh, ecological uh, research uh, towards BioCities. Another chapter, next, 
for instance, chapter five will deal mainly, is dealing actually, because we are writing it right now, is dealing mainly with uh, air quality, uh, with microclimate issues and other ecosystem services, like for instance, carbon sequestration that is so important, but together also the removal of uh, pollution from uh, the atmosphere that actually is so is also uh, demonstrating his role also in relation to health. Next chapter, next. And uh, of course, uh, a very important chapter will be uh, about biocities as promoters of health uh, and well-being, and we have seen how important these is. These issues are, uh, I mean, when we are dealing with this uh, disaster of the pandemics. Next, and so these are all the different aspects that uh, are being taken into consideration for health, not only physical health, but also, of course, mental health, particularly of children, so not only adults, but also children. That's so important. Next one. And uh, as I said, all this information, uh, mainly stressing the uh, gaps in knowledge, but also the need for new research, will be uh, fed into the uh, Rebio project that is coordinated by uh, Jerry Lee and is dealing with the uh, research agenda. Next. And so we will work on providing visions and narratives for biocities, but also helping Jerry Lee's uh, um, I mean, colleagues to prepare white papers uh, for the fields of action uh, of this new uh, research facility. There will be uh, discussion uh, in different webinars. There are already discussion in different, very, uh, let's say, inspiring and challenging webinars. And also, we will uh, exchange people uh, with the other group uh, in writing the different chapters. So this is the action that we are um, involved with right now. And I give the word back to Jerry Lee. Thank you. Thank you, Giuseppe, for this nice presentation. I will continue with the research gaps. So as uh, Giuseppe said, I'm coordinating the Rebio project, which is financed by the EFI Network Fund, and we are concentrating on the research agenda. And with me, with we, I mean these partners um, that are involved. We are nine partners, that uh, eight partners that are involved. And in this part of the, uh, in, the in our part of the project, we are concentrating in trying to analyze why the transformation is not happening. And our aim is to identify the research gaps that need to be closed in order to trigger such a transformation into uh, bio-based uh, cities. So how, how we proceed, we have developed a research appro approach, of course, and this gray box is uh, the inputs that we are receiving from the other consortium. And then we proceed in, in four main steps in order to develop the research agenda. In the first step, we will receive, uh, we, we, we received the, um, because it's an ongoing process, we received uh, the information, the, the vision of, and the, and the narratives of the BioCity Consortium. And in this step, in our part of the project, we are trying to identify strategies for BioCities. And in this context, we are trying to, to, to ask ourselves which drivers shape the future of bio-based uh, cities and how important and certain uh, these drivers are. And this is a, an ongoing process. We are working with several webinars with uh, consortium members from both, uh, from both consortia. In a second step, we uh, are working with fields of actions. We defined five main uh, fields of actions. We are also correlate with the chapter, uh, a little bit with the chapters uh, of the other, con uh, of, of the BioCity Consortium. Uh, which is working on the Green Book, and you will see later when I present each of these, uh, how they relate to, uh, to which chapter they relate. And here we are trying uh, through a series of webinars that we are running, not only with members of our consortium, but with experts from, uh, from people working in this field. We, we are trying to identify the, the, the major research gaps in, in each one of these fields of action. 
In webinar A, which is uh, uh, biodiversity, the subtopics we will concentrate on is in increased uh, biodiversity in order to enhance uh, health and uh, health of urban trees. Also, we will concentrate on nature-based solutions and, in, and green infrastructure in the context of biodiversity. And this uh, webinar or, uh, relates to the chapters three and 11 from the other consortium. In the second uh, one, we have circular bioeconomy, and here we are concentrating on forests and forest um, products in a circular bioeconomy, innovation and construction uh, as, uh, and new materials, as well as renaturalization and self-sufficiency. And you can see here to which chapters it relates uh, concerning the other consortium. Then we have climate change and bioresilience, and here the, the subtopics topic, sub we, will, uh, we will concentrating on are uh, biophysical environment and challenges, also climate change and climate mitigation capacities and resilience, and resilience of urban forests. Then we have also bioresilience, which uh, relates to microclimate through trees, roles of trees, head islands. And we have also the aspect of water management, uh, meaning the flood, uh, flood uh, control instruments and tools for successful water management, blue infrastructure, restoration of water, et cetera. And this relates to chapter five of the other consortium. Then we have a further webinar, which is governance. And here the main topics will be uh, multi-level governance and legislation, as well as planning and urban design and participation and networks, uh, meaning not only the networks, so networks means uh, not only the, it, it, it means it's in two sides, not only the networks between institutions, but also uh, related to stakeholders. And we have a further aspect, which is the enhancement of ecological knowledge. And this relates to several chapters uh, from the other consortium. The last webinar we are running is about uh, social environment. And here it's the, the, the health aspect that is strongly being considered and uh, the urbanization as a general trend in urbanization, demographic changes. What does this, this, this has an influence in this, um, this transformation into bio-based cities and also the social cultural environment and challenges. And here you can see to which chapters it relates from the other consortium. So here, um, we are in the process of organizing the, these webinars uh, to, re, uh, to think about the questions we want to ask to the experts that we will be involved. And of course, if you would like, as so all participants of this conference, if you would like to participate in one of these webinars because you feel that you have, uh, that, you, that you want to contribute uh, in this, on this regard, please, please uh, uh, become uh, so be uh, write to me an email and my email you will find it at the end of the um, of the presentation and we will be happy to integrate you in this process. The third step is writing these white papers, which are actually the result of each of these uh, webinars that we are running for a uh, pro field of action as of biodiversity, circular bioeconomy, etc. And these white papers will be the first version of the research agenda because a lot of research gaps will be uh, identified and, and already assessed. And, and, and in the last step, will be, um, we will cross-validate our results with other country initiatives to identify uh, such uh, research gaps that are go uh, currently um, going on. Exactly. And with, with our project, we hope that we are able to upscale this transformation process and thus that we are able to contribute to the success of the FA BioCities facility. So we are really looking forward to it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much to uh, Jerry Lee and Giuseppe. I just sent a, a note saying, please, could you draw to a conclusion? And you did so instantly. I very rarely have such power and influence. Um, so thank you very much. We'll move straight on. Um, our uh, third uh, speaker this morning uh, is uh, from an architecture uh, background and uh, well known. Um, and that's uh, Vincente um, uh, Boulat. I apologize, I've probably not pronounced the name very well. Um, uh, uh, he's uh, based in Barcelona. 
uh, of course, very famous city for its architecture. Um, and he works in the development of projects uh, for ecological uh, cities and buildings around the world. He was, in fact, the chief uh, architect of the city of Barcelona, the founder of the Institute of Advanced Architecture of Catalonia, and uh, he currently works uh, in the development of biocities uh, at a um, the Valadura uh, Lab Center. So thank you, Vincente, for joining us this morning. If you'd like to share your screen, uh, we'll proceed straight away. Yes, so thank you for your invitation. For me, it's really a pleasure to be with all of you. Um, so, yeah, I have, uh, to, uh, uh, nowadays I have two roles. I am running the Vaidaura Labs at the Institute of Advanced Architecture of Catalonia, and I have my own firm, Wayart Architects, that are doing projects around the world. But also I was chief architect of Barcelona during four years, and this gave me a broader perspective about what the city should be and how we, we could learn how we could transform them. And I will say that if 20 years ago, the new frontier was to merge the digital world and the, and the cities and the physical world, now the new frontier is to merge uh, urbanity with nature. That the nature, uh, that the cities le learn from nature in order to organize themselves and to transform themselves. So with Mark, uh, we are members of the European Forest Institute. We have learned all the research uh, that is uh, under, under development related with the um, with, uh, uh, circular bioeconomy. But our focus is mostly concentrated in cities because this is the way we have built cities during the 20th century. This is <clears throat> Uh, China, but this is a paradigm of the so-called modern city that in fact was invented, was developed 100 years ago by the Bauhaus. Today that we are talking about the new Bauhaus movement, we should remember that part of the architecture and the culture and the arts were great, but part of the urbanism that they were planning with this functional segregation of the cities had a terrible impact in the, in the planet. And then this industrial city that today we are living is something like this, a city that is importing goods from all over the world and is generating trash or is generating emissions. And from our point of view, we should move forward and we should reinvent the way we think about cities. In fact, every 50 years, there is a major definition about oh, how cities should be developed. 100 years ago, we had the Bauhaus and the modern city. In the 70s, after the crisis of the oil crisis, uh, we, we had a, a revision uh, coming back to the historical centers. And now after these pandemics and in the middle of this climate crisis, we should reinvent what cities are by defining what we could call the bio cities. Uh, so the idea is that we uh, cities follow the natural rules, cities in fact they should uh, let's say eat CO2 instead to uh, uh, emit generate emissions. We should uh, um, uh, develop on and have production of local food. We should uh, use renewable energy and we should define a new paradigm uh, out of all of this. So cities are not an accumulation of independent things because in order to do a city, we need to have an holistic vision about how, how we do it. We know where we have forests today in the world. Uh, um, but the big challenge that we have in front of us is that if we follow this data that we receive from uh, United Nations by 2050, the bad news is that more than 1 billion will be urbanized in the next 30 years. And then we should build the equivalent to one city of 3 million people, the equivalent of one Madrid or a bit smaller than one Berlin every month in the next 30 years. And if we keep doing business as usual, 
will destroy the planet for sure. So that's why uh, we are working. We are working also with Giuseppe and with other people uh, developing this green book and also developing many projects around the world. And then our definitions about biocities are that biocities are cities that follow the principles of natural systems to promote life. So we want, we want to go beyond urban forestry as an idea of using trees in order to, uh, let's say, to, to modify the impact that the real cities are having. So in the last years, ecology was something that we were using in order to mitigate the effect of the real economy. But now the uh, ecology is the new economy. So there is not one version of the economy that is something ugly and dirty and something that we are going to, to use to save it. We need to merge and to have a solution where the ecology is the new economy and where bio cities are the real cities that follow the natural systems. So we developed this city anatomy uh, 10 years ago when we were working uh, in the city of Barcelona trying to define cities and as an holistic system of systems where everything is interconnected. It will be long to explain, but it has an uh, IOS, uh, ISO, um, uh, let's say, approved. And I would like to explain you very shortly four initiatives. One, uh, I mean, everyone knows, or many people know Barcelona, that is this dense and compact area, but few people know that, in fact, in the metropolitan area of Barcelona, 50% of the surface are forest. And then this big park is called Coiserola. And in our institute, we decided some time ago to look for a place where we could experiment with the nature. And then we own these 130 hectares, uh, just very near Barcelona. And our idea was to rethink how we, uh, we live, how we build, how we eat, how we organize our life in an holistic way that this diagram is from the year 2008. So is what today we could call the circular economy. And then in this place that uh, it looks like an old uh, uh, house from 19th century. In fact, we have a la laboratory where uh, we, we have a sustainable plan to manage forest. So we have learned uh, how to manage forests. We produce uh, um, uh, wood that has this system for the traceability. As you can see here, we cut our own wood. We produce these, uh, these panels. We have a, a small CLT press uh, in order to produce CLT cross laminated timber panels. We have a, la a laboratory where we have some digital tools. And what we do is we, we develop prototypes of the architecture to come uh, using our local resources. So they are even less than one kilometer distance where all of this is happening. And then uh, we are developing prototypes. In this, case, the, in this case, this was developed last year. We call it the quarantine cabin, but because it was developed to be used for our quarantines. But you can see here this uh, quality of the architecture that we have produced in a small scale. So we do this in a small scale using our local food because we want our local food because we want to do it in a big scale, in a country level scale or a continent level where we can produce most of our uh, new buildings using timber. You know, the 19th century, the main material for construction was, or the new material was steel. 20th century has been concrete and 21st century can be wood, but a new industrialized wood. So with this uh, experiment, we were testing ourselves, our capacity to have an holistic understanding and developing an holistic process from the tree, from the nature, developing a sustainable management of forests until the ecological constructions. But also we have developed some software because we have a full traceability of every piece of material that we are using for our constructions. One of the big problems from the ODS, from the um, in, uh, indicators for the sustainable management is that really we, we don't count them. We are doing too much politics and we are doing very few actions. 
you know, in general, everyone say in, in Europe, we, uh, we approve a, a rule in the year 2010 that by 2020, every building should be zero emissions. And this is not happening. And now we are in 2020 and we decide to fix uh, the new objective for 2030. And in 2030, we'll fix the objective for 2040. And you know, no one is looking what we decide that we should be doing. So that's why numbers are so important because we need to be accountable. If we are not accountable about our actions, we will not have any real resource. And that's why we are doing traceability for our building because even today, there are people talking about the ecological concrete that is an oxymoron, you know? It's like trying to lie and to lie ourselves because the reality is that we are not going deeper and taking seriously the global uh, uh, the global warming in a very deep and sustainable way. In fact, I am happy that finally the European Union decide that by 2050 we need to be a zero emissions continent, but we need to work very hard and to use numbers in order to, to develop it. Another initiative we are developing is uh, creating uh, timber, urban uh, buildings with timber. And then this is a diagram that explains how we can manage the forest and how we can uh, produce timber for industrialized construction. Here are several, uh, well, the three main technologies that we use for the timber building. Uh, and the most uh, interesting one uh, that today we are using is, here, is this one, the cross laminated uh, timber, because can produce a very high efficiency use of, of wood uh, as, uh, using these panels that are crossing the pieces of timber. So this is the uh, system of panels and the new factories that can produce this uh, panel for the construction. And then using this technology, in fact, we won a, a competition in, in China, in Xuan, that is a new city uh, near Beijing, uh, where we were developing a new concept for buildings that we would like to create a new standard because the buildings were self-sufficient. Uh, buildings were producing energy, were producing food, and were promoting life. Uh, then from this point of view, the building has uh, an internal metabolic system. Uh, you see where we have here some working areas, but living areas, and in the, green, uh, in the room, we, we put some greenhouses. You see this timber building with big terraces, and on the top we have greenhouses because the idea to, I mean, the key question is we need to approach the production of resources to the place where we are going to consume. We need to stop bringing tomatoes from Brazil. We can produce tomatoes anywhere in the world, including Iceland or including Berlin or including Barcelona, if we do in the in the proper way. And uh, obviously, we can produce uh, energy uh, from our solar panels and so on. So there are many projects now under development, development of using timber for architecture, and this is one of them. With these big terraces, uh, this project was developed during the. Uh, pandemics moment. Well, in Barcelona, we had another interesting project where we, you know, this was the, in theory, the main square, the Plaza de las Glorias, and uh, we make a big mistake in the year 92. Well, someone did it, building a highway here, you know, that's incredible. What should be the core of the city, someone decided to bring the wrong model, the wrong model, the, the, making a park and ride system in the city core, no? And that's why only uh, in the, uh, five years ago, we, we developed this plan to demolish uh, this infrastructure and then to create a park in the city center. So that means that many times the changes start from the center because you need to send a very clear message about what you want to do. And there are many other projects happening about the renaturalization, for example, this all kind of urban highway. Now is uh, we are developing this uh, green infrastructure in the city center. We, I wrote that book, The Self-Sufficient City, in the year 2011. And our partner from Baidaura Labs wrote that book, Boot Urbanism, that are, uh, I think, good sample of what 
we should how we could think about the future of our cities because if we don't think about the future the future will think for us you know the natural forces of the economy will produce the deforestation and and so on and the and with the fire we'll see the destruction of our planet and that's why we have been working also in africa in new uh, forms of urbanity going from the traditional urban grid that somehow built on top of the nature uh, to new systems that are le learning from the nature, uh, developing uh, uh, this forest city uh, using this branch system that in fact generate density, but at the same time promote and, and, and uh, protect the nature and uh, also promote the continuity in the nature around the city itself. So we are very much interested in working in uh, both in Europe, but also in emerging country where we can develop new forms of urbanity using uh, nature-based solutions. And uh, in order to discuss that and to celebrate that, by 2022, Barcelona has been uh, uh, chosen as European Forest City. Uh, we will have six months of activity starting what is starting March 21st next year, and then we'll have a, a, a meeting from the European Forest Institute and, and friends, and everyone is invited to come there, uh, and the research topic uh, will be biocities. So that's all you have here in my email, and if anyone want to have any question or contact, I am open for any kind of collaboration. I am very happy to, to have new friends coming from the forest environment. Um, we are learning a lot about from biology. And what we would like is really to create a new knowledge uh, and to merge this knowledge with my friend Giuseppe. We are working very hard in this new uh, Green Book of Biocities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Vincente, and um, an, an inspiring um, uh, talk also inspiring images as well. Um, I made a note here of uh, two, two quotes that I think are really perhaps um, summarize our session this morning is that ecology is the new economy and the bio cities are the real cities. Um, so I think that on those uh, notes, we can probably uh, finish this session. So finally, a big thank you to our speakers, Vicente in Barcelona, Harriet in uh, Durham today, Giuseppe in Italy and Jerry Lee who has already had to rush off to do teaching at her university in Switzerland. So thank you very much. And uh, we'll move now to a break. Please continue to use the online Q&A. Thank you. <laughs>